This is R.J. Rushduni, Easy Chair Number 189, March 10, 1989. This evening, Otto Scott and I are going to discuss decadence. You can call the subject also the growing departure from reality in our time, or the insanity, as it were, of men and nations. At any rate, the general subject is decadence. We could perhaps uh, deal with the subject just by reading the daily paper into uh, the uh, microphone, because what we see all around us gives evidence of decadence. Otto Scott, some time back, defined decadence very powerfully, and I'm going to leave it to him to repeat that. I shall deal with it by calling attention to the kind of thing that represents moral decay, represents decadence in wisdom, in law, in a culture. This is an item from the USA Today for Tuesday, March the 7th, 1989, page 3A, and it reads, Rapist Outrage, a judge's decision to spare rapist David Cavallaro in a prison term because the young man wants to become a police officer has outraged many in Salt St. Marie, Michigan. Judge Charles Stark, Convicted student Caballero, 21, under a Youthful Offender Act that spared him a minimum five-year term for sexually assaulting a female student at Lake Superior State University. I think they would like to lynch the judge if they had him right here, said local newspaper editor Ken Pizzari. Prosecutors are appealing. Well, that is the kind of thing that uh, increasingly is in evidence. Many of you have sent me clippings of like incidents where judges have acted as though they have demonstrated their nobility by forgiving criminals when it is not in their right to forgive him, and then feeling that the public outcry against what they have done represents a depravity on the part of the people. This kind of thing represents a departure from reality. And it's more and more with us. Wherever we turn, we find this warping of vision, a warping of moral insight on the part of more and more people, especially people in high places. Otto, do you want to start off with a general statement on decadence. Yes. <clears throat> the definition of decadence that I quoted some time back is from a small book on the, on the word, in which the author, and I'm sorry I didn't bring it with me tonight, the author defined decadence as the condition which overcomes a country when it will no longer fight. Now, if we take that definition, he said not wine, women, and song, because that often accompanies victory and the results of fighting. If we were to take that definition and step back a bit and look at what Kennedy, the historian, called the rise and fall of great powers, and in our time, the greatest power to fall has been the British Empire. And you and I were young. Most of the map was salmon pink, yes. representing the possessions of the British Empire. A British, very small island with a relatively small population, controlled almost one-third of all the people in the world, the largest empire ever known to history. It's succumbed to decadence even though it fought well 
in World War II, the last major war in which it was engaged. But the ruling class succumbed, not the people. The ruling class succumbed, and it's very interesting now to compare their attitudes, let us say, in 18, from 1885 to 1910, with the attitudes of the American ruling class today. They didn't want to pay for defense. They didn't want to expand or maintain the Navy. Churchill and Lord Fisher had a terrible struggle to get them to switch the Navy into, from coal to oil, although that was obviously the coming thing. In order to stay up with Germany, they would had to do it. They were forced to do it. They did it very reluctantly. They also refused to do anything about the steady diminution of their productivity, the loss of their heavy industrial sales around the world, and the influx of foreign goods that came in. They refused to do anything about the fact that they could no longer feed themselves, and they refused to put up a tariff wall to protect their agricultural interests. In almost every respect, you find the British uh, from 1885 to 1910, the British governing class, that is, expressing all kinds of noble socialist principles, liberal principles, as they're called, allowing their country to decay around them, the empire to get very soft, and compare that with our governing class and its attitudes today. It isn't simply the rapists that are getting off. Mm -hmm. Lots of people are getting off. Yes. And in the meantime, we're sliding. Yes. When we were young, as you mentioned, the saying was, the sun never sets on the British flag. And it was true. I think one of the most horrifying stories about its collapse came shortly after World War II. Two men, two uh, people, husband and wife, both morally decadent to the nth degree, Lord and Lady Mountbatten, were sent to India to resolve the problems there. And their resolution was the most incredibly uh, wrong-headed one imaginable, and it led to the murder of millions of people as independence was granted and India was divided. And yet, Mountbatten returned to be honored and to the time of his death regarded as a great man for being the author of a tremendous tragedy, a holocaust. Well, six million, I understand, died. Yes. Well, let's compare that particular triumph which incidentally is still hailed as a great step forward in human progress because India is now independent and they're, they're eating each other alive in that horrible subcontinent. Let's compare that particular event with something, a lesser, but more recent event in which is hailed by the United States government as a great triumph of diplomacy, the Angola Treaty between Angola and yeah. South Africa. We uh, pride ourselves on having played the part of a broker in that treaty. The South Africans who have been supporting Zavimbi in his fight against the Marxist government of Angola, is South Africa has agreed to curtail all support to Zavimbi. It also agreed to pull all its troops out of Angola within a six-month period. In response, the Cubans in Angola are to pull out over a 28-month period, and I understand that there are over 10,000 Cuban soldiers who have taken out Angolan citizenship, married Angolan women, and are settled there, which of course helps the infrastructure of the Marcus, Marxist government. In addition to this, the South Africans have agreed to pull out of Mozambique, which is now called Namibia by our press, or it used to be called Southwest Africa, which is very rich in mineral uh, resources. So, and, and who agreed to free a uh, UN 
conducted elections in Mozambique, which will be dominated, as everyone knows, by a Marxist group called SWAPO. So Mozambique, which is next door to South Africa, will go communist. Angola, which incidentally the uh, an American oil company has been providing the Angolan Marxist government with enough money to pay the Cuban troops with the blessings of our State Department and our White House. Now, on the face of it, this looks like a very strange treaty for South Africa to make. The treaty was signed, by the way, in New York. Chester Crocker, Under Secretary of State of the United States, was the arbiter. The Angolan diplomat who signed for his government took occasion to issue a long diatribe against the United States, which was not covered by our press. Instead, Chester Crocker was praised. I'm not sure that he got a medal, but I'm sure he'll got, he got something. And many editorials appeared on the wonderful peace that has now been brought to Southern Africa. But my friends from South Africa tell me that something entirely different has taken place. What they say is that when we applied sanctions against South Africa, the Soviet bloc and the Soviet Union did not do that. They abstained. They don't have any embassy in South Africa because, of course, they say they're against apartheid, and we all know how much the Soviet Union is in favor of human rights. They're famous for it. In any event, they, instead of applying sanctions against South Africa, they increased their orders. They increased the business they're doing. Then they came to the South African government, sotto voce, or uh, behind the scenes, because the two countries have always collaborated with one another on the, on the metals market scene internationally, and said, we will stop supplying money to the African National Congress we will no longer send arms or ammunition into the black revolutionaries of South Africa if you will cooperate with us in all your international dealings instead of the West. The South African government, my friends say, have agreed because, they say, the United States is the greatest double-crossing nation in the world. They came against us, although we have been a loyal and faithful ally all through the years. They drove us into the arms of the Soviets, and at least if we make a deal with the Soviets, we can stay in power, the blacks will not take over, and we can get an extension on our survival. Now that's the sort of diplomacy which I think deserves the word decadence because we did this in order to placate the black voter in the United States at the expense of our future stability. Yes. Um, decadence involves a loss of any sense of reality. And that's what characterizes our foreign policy. This treaty is comparable to the one we made when we withdrew from Vietnam, supposedly uh, leaving behind something that was for the welfare of the people. And we know what happened. I think this loss of a sense of reality increasingly marks our time. We don't want to face up to reality. I have a book here, which we were discussing briefly before we began, James E. Oberg, Uncovering Soviet Disasters, Exploring the Limits of Glasnost, published in 1988 by a random house. And the uh, chapter titles are things like Anthrax in Sverdlovsk, Accidents on ice, the bloody border, military disasters, submarines, disasters afloat and on land in the air, super projects, dead cosmonauts, exploding rockets, reactors from the sky, the Urals disaster, nuclear gulag, and so on and on. How the Soviet Union has been faced with one disaster after another but they will not admit to the world that these have happened, nor to themselves. They will not 
face up to their growing internal collapse realistically. And if it were not for us propping them up, they would collapse. Oh, yes. So it's this kind of thing that marks the world today, the inability to face reality, the insistence that their pronouncements are the reality, not what has happened. Well, it's a complex situation. Apparently, prosperity is bad for the human character. Apparently, God does us a favor when he keeps us poor, although it's hard for <laughs> us to, to accept that. I'm convinced that God has determined that money would ruin me and he's doing me a great <laughs> favor by keeping it out of my hands. And, but time and again, we see the spectacle of a country becoming rich and fat and then rich and stupid. And then finally rich and cowardly. Back in the 1950s, beginning of the 60s, Robert Ardre wrote a, a number of books, and one of his theses, which I think has a limited amount of truth, although I don't buy it basically, is in line with what you just said. He described uh, the human race as bad weather animals. In other words, they thrive best. Uh, in very, bad weather. I agree. A good observation because it's only against something that we develop our strength. Mm -hmm. And uh, when people become very comfortably situated, the first thing they worry about is keeping what they've got. Mm -hmm. And the next thing is to being secure and then to being safe. Well... Let me add parenthetically, I'm afraid that uh, Chalcedon is overloaded with character. <laughs> because <laughs> we have not been made rich. Well, that's the reason we keep writing, mm -hmm. we keep discussing, we keep struggling. Mm -hmm. If we were rich, why would we have to struggle? Oh, I'd do it anyway. you do it anyway. I love it, and you do too. Well, you'll never get a chance to prove it at the rate we're going. <laughs> well, getting back to the problem of the world decadence, since World War II, there has been a growing heedlessness. You dated it in the case of Britain, from about 1910, and I think quite rightly so. And the developments that led to World War I were a part of the decadence of the time, because very few, when they went to war, in that war, had any recognition of what they were doing to civilization. And uh, we came out of it we went into it under the illusion that uh, we were going to make the world safe for democracy. Our president, Woodrow Wilson, with his diplomacy, was going to be the world of Messiah. And that term was applied to him. Well, we've only increased in our departure from uh, a realistic assessment of things, from having any vision. And... Of course, Proverbs tells us where there is no vision, the people perish. And by vision, it means a knowledge of what God's reality is. And uh, more literally, the second part is uh, the people perish. The people run naked. They're crazy. They're wild. So lacking that vision... The people have been running wild. They have been running naked all over the world. Well, of course, another meaning of the word vision is a goal or a purpose. Yes. A life without a purpose is an empty and very unhappy life. If you don't know where you're going, you don't know what direction to face, 
what direction to head in, what your efforts are supposed to add up to. I don't think that one's material comfort or the, uh, the size of the house or the educational level of the children or the amount of clothes and cars you have uh, constitutes a purpose in life. A purpose has to be something larger than your individual destiny. And God, of course, becomes the great companion to people who believe his presence and who will accept his rule and then find that they have the courage to pursue their talents and their purpose in the world to, and to stand up in honesty against all adversity. Yes. A great many people have tunnel vision. Now, tunnel vision is when you have a problem with the eyes so that you can only see a little spot ahead. You don't have a broad range of vision. It's a very sad uh, uh, kind of eye defect. But Ford Schwartz was telling me a while back how some years ago when he spent a while in Mexico, he stayed with uh, some people in a village, the only non-Mexican there. He found them to be very kindly and gracious people, but very limited, because all they could was to do things exactly as everyone else did so that their daily food was limited day after day to tortilla and beans. But they were living on the edge of the ocean. And he said day after day he caught fish in a matter of minutes. Excellent eating, tasty varieties. But the Mexicans rarely ever touched the fish. They did things only as they had done them generation after generation. Now, that's tunnel vision. That's a lack of any real vision. And that is exceedingly common. We can see it in the Mexicans, but we don't see it in ourselves. Well, we do have it. Uh, <clears throat> Congress is lurching from one issue to the next. Our corporations operate on short-term basis. Every three months they have to add up everything and pay the tax collector and so forth, issue dividends and whatnot. So three months is a very short length of time. Yes. Uh, the average person, if you say where you're going, will say downtown. Quo Vadis, somebody said in a, a, a sort of a satirical column where the protagonist stopped people on the street and said, Quo Vadis, whither art thou go? Whither thou goest? And most people can tell you. And got a call from a pollster once when we lived in New York some years back. And the woman wanted to know her goal in life. And she said, I'm an Anglican. And the poster said, well, that's not the question. She said, well, that's the answer. And <laughs> hung up. And it was a good answer. Uh, if you're a Christian, you have a goal in life. You don't, that's the highest possible goal. And underneath that goal is to how do you lead a good life in a constructive way. But our government has no goal. We have commitments all around the world. We're supporting millions upon millions. Well, actually, we're supporting other governments. We're not supporting the people in other countries. We're supporting the governments of other countries. And in most cases, left-wing and socialist and Marxist governments, like the government of Angola that we just played Lord Bountiful to. This is not a goal for people. God did not put us together to support the governments of the world. No. That's, not a wor that's not even a sensible activity, let alone a, a worthy one. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the short-term outlook of corporations because of our general tax structure. Of course, the existentialist mentality of people creates such a short-term outlook. Now, occasionally I have problems with somebody who 
wants to know uh, why in the world we have uh, so many people on our staff. We have ten. That's a lot. I'm talking about writers. You're talking about writers, yes. Full-time and part-time. Mm -hmm. And all they're interested in, these people, and I'm glad to say their number is not uh, great. And uh, what are they producing for the report next month? And I tell them, well, some of these people are working long range on writing projects, and uh, this is the way we want it. And some of us are working both long range and short range in terms of providing something for the monthly report. But they can't see anything long range. That uh, is meaningless to them. And they make this kind of demand of their uh, churches, of their uh, civil government, of everything. It's the kind of mentality that leads people to demand of a pastor, as one pastor told me. Uh, what are you doing for us senior citizens? And in another instance, uh, what are you doing for the teenagers or the college age? as though the function of the church is to meet the needs of people rather than people submitting themselves to God to be used by him. We have this type of existentialist mentality in which we are the center. And of course this leads to decadence because no man is fit to be the goal of his own life. Well, that's true. And going back to the manifestations of decadence in the case of the author I mentioned cowardice mm -hmm. or refusal to fight for your country when a country refuses to fight for itself mm -hmm. this was of course as you recall the classic judgment on ancient Greece in which the historian said they sought security in order to attained security they sacrificed honor having sacrificed honor they sacrificed they lost courage having lost courage they lost everything in the end and he said in the end we can sum it all up as a failure of nerve mm -hmm. now a failure of nerve reflects itself in very different ways the failure to take unpopular positions, even though you know that they may be correct, is a failure of nerve. The judge's failure was an attempt to actually uh, curry favor with the liberal community, and he made a mistake in this particular case of this particular rapist. The community was not in favor of that. But our judges in general are political judges, political lawyers who sit on the bench who rule according to what they consider the prevailing trends in the community. Yes. I'd like to uh, call attention now to something that uh, one of our Chalcedon friends and supporters has written. Douglas Grootheis in his book, Confronting the New Age, published in 1988 by InterVarsity Press, had this to say about New Age thinking. And I quote, The phrase, create your own reality, is often intoned in New Age circles as a basic premise. The idea is that we are not underway under any objective moral law. Rather, we all have different ways to realize our divine potential. And since all is one, or monism, we can't slice up life into categories like good versus evil. That is too dualistic. We must move beyond good and evil in order to realize our full potential. A supposed spirit guide named Ramtha teaches that God, of which we are all a part, is neither good nor bad. God does not judge. No one sins, and there is no need for forgiveness. Ramtha continues, Every vile and wretched thing you do broadens your understanding. If you want to do any one thing, regardless of what it is, 
it would not be wise to go against that feeling for there is an experience awaiting you in a grand adventure that will make your life sweeter." Unquote. Now we have New Age thinking infiltrating our law, our courts, our schools, in that everyone chooses his own values and those are good for him. And the saying was for a long time that uh, you could do anything you chose as long as you did not do physical harm to someone against his own will. But of course, the thinking of the Marquis de Sade is now being increasingly popular and publicized, namely that doing violence to anyone you choose is your right. So that New Age thinking, which says, if you have a desire to do something, do it, because there is no good nor evil, represents the decadence of our time. You create your own reality, according to uh, New Age thinking, as uh, Douglas Grutheis has so powerfully uh, demonstrated in this book. Well, that's very interesting. The Beyond good and evil was one of these phrases that uh, the transcendentalists used, and that was a favorite of Emerson's. He was quite eloquent on that, the higher law. Mm-hmm. And as we know, uh, transcendentalism and Unitarianism, which was a, a New England variation of Hinduism, yes. which uh, Emerson was steeped in, uh, was one of the elements that led to the Holocaust of the Civil War. Now, we find the same thing appearing again in the decadent period of Victorian Europe, or Victorian England. Nietzsche talking about beyond good and evil, thus spake Zarathustra, uh, this Ubermensch, and so forth, the Superman. And we see the Holocaust of World War I. Then after that, in between the wars, we hear uh, somewhat differently phrased the idea that the human life is unimportant beside the necessity of the state enunciated by Hitler and Mussolini and, of course, by Stalin before both of them, or at the same time, resulting in the massacres of World War II and since. Now what we're talking about here, what you are just quoted, is the famous uh, uh, sequence where the United States, somebody said it and I'll repeat it, picks up every idea of Europe 30 years after Europe proves it didn't work. We are now in repeating what Europe has done again and again. This is sheer Hinduism. Yes. Absolute. To call it New Age is nonsense. There's nothing new about Hinduism with its seven degrees of hell and the idea that God is both good and evil at the same time and you can get to nirvana either way. Uh, only an illiterate would fail to recognize. And I remember telling a highly respected figure in my own past one time who talked about the wonderful philosophies of India that I would pay his way to Bombay and let him stay there for a month and I would pay all his expenses just to shut him up. We go and you see the naked fakers in the street. You see the girls in the cages in the streets of Bombay. And they're the seedbed of all these rabid ideas which are now hailed here as the New Age. Now, we can go down into the swamp of the Orient, of course, and there will be nobody left with any intelligence to mourn our departure. I, some years back, knew a couple of men who did go and who had all kinds of illusions about the exotic Far East one a young man, college age, the other an older man. And it was a shattering experience for them that they suppressed because it told them about the reality of evil 
and the reality of man as a fallen creature which they did not want to admit and I think their suppression of the reality marks our age we do not want as an age to know what evil is unless of course it was Hitler and we killed him and now we just mop up on a few of these uh, extremists we will be in a safe. world state of we, we will be safe from evil yes. isn't it interesting somebody said to me recently that we're still searching out Hitler's accomplices but Stalin didn't have any yes there are no extradition there's no war trials no crimes no no commissions no investigations of all the torturers of the Soviet and yet they killed as many people as Hitler they killed more people than Hitler and including Jews and every other race and nationality but uh, the inability to confront evil is a very serious impediment to one's life well uh, you mentioned a book on decadence I have one not a very good book in fact a very bad one because after dealing with the subject cynically he dismisses it as a relic of a Christian past oh that's a very bad book yes so he says it is impossible to define decadence because for him of course there is no such thing as good nor evil and since all things are equal and all things are acceptable to use the term decadence is to think mythically well if that's the case uh, we wonder how he defends himself and his family if there are no values then why are so many people defending Rushdie yes. uh, what is all this nonsense about free speech when a particular oxen is gored out of the whole herd there's only two or three sacred oxen we really can't get too noble about the Indians you know because we've got some taboos walking around of fearsome size well uh, the new age thinking which of course is uh, as Grutais points out and as you did far eastern Hindu thinking uh, says create your own reality mm. and these people are creating their own reality and they are denying the validity of your and my idea of reality and of good and evil oh yes so that uh, there is only one reality and it is that which we affirm I was very interested uh, recently in a letter from Phil Spielman uh, a superb letter like almost everything he writes and he described going to one of these intellectual soirees in Berkeley and the question of the greatest evil of this century came up and of course it was not Stalinism, not even Hitlerism. It was, this woman told him very intensely and earnestly, fundamentalism. 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 Has anyone ever defined it? <laughs> well, for her, of course, it was obvious. It was a belief in good and evil. Mm. It was a belief in God, a belief in absolutes, mm -hmm. in a moral law. Mm -hmm. Well, that's forbidden. Yes. That's, that's what you'd call forbidden thoughts <laughs> underground underground thoughts yes <laughs> especially in a place like Berkeley well Berkeley of course I started to smile when you said an intellectual soiree in, in Berkeley which is a contradiction in terms <laughs> probably the greatest collection of stupidity that the world has seen in quite a long time is present in Berkeley they have uh, created a housing shortage of monstrous proportions. Uh, they, uh, it's a seething mass of racial, ethnic, and religious hatreds. Uh, how the school maintains its reputation is a matter of, of wonder to me. Uh, I seldom hear of anything in, in, intelligent coming out of it. 
Well, uh, Harvard and Yale and all the other schools are no different. They're all competing to excel in the same kind of decadence. They all have a very high reputation amongst the elite journalists and the governing class, mm -hmm. but I fail to see any evidence of superior scholarship coming out of them. We haven't had, nationally speaking, a first-rate philosopher since William James died. Mm -hmm. We have no world-class conceptual thinkers at all. Well, that is in the academic community in the, outside of the church. That's, well, <laughs> that's, that's about it. The academic yes. community is, is gnawing on its own tail. Well, the uh, caliber of the universities is too often ascertained by counting the number of books they have in their libraries, the extent of their endowment, the size of their facilities, the number of departments and faculty members, and so on. So it's a quantitative analysis the world over now. Well, we have more students, and we have more teachers. Uh, Spain went this route. It had more churches and cathedrals, nunneries and, mo and monasteries, schools, uh, than any other country up to that time in the history of Europe. It, it, it spent a tremendous amount of money on it, and it produced a class that felt that labor was beneath its dignity, yes. which is very similar to the class that we're producing. Most of these young men don't want to get their hands dirty. They don't want to do anything physical. They want to be able to think without a brain, which is a miracle that's denied most of them. Spain, I believe, now has one of the larger universities in the world with 50,000 students. So... <laughs> you get lost there. Yes. And never forget Henry Adams mm -hmm. at a time when the United States was still virile, the 1860s, early 1870s perhaps, being sent to Heidelberg by his father after Harvard. Now, he said in those days Harvard used the tutorial method. Your tutor gave you a bunch of books to read, and you would discuss them with him, and then you would get together with your professor once or twice a week to discuss the subject. At the end of the four years, the professors knew whether or not you knew, and he said it was all very pleasant. Then he went to Heidelberg, and he said in Heidelberg they had a monstrous class. He said all the other students drank beer all the time, never studied, because each professor gave the same lecture every time, and they passed the lecture around before the examination so that nobody could fail, and he said there were no questions, no question and answer. The professor was on a platform. He spoke. You shut up, and you made notes. He said he hoped the United States would never fall into such a dreadful system. Well, I think the lecture method is superior if it's done properly because the tutorial destroys the professors. Very few of them can produce anything because they're endlessly uh, occupied with students. And uh, if you have a, a large number of students and you have to see them all a few hours a week or a month, think of what that does to your time. No, the professor isn't the tutor. The professor is also involved. He's involved. He's involved. Well, I've had both. I've had lectures and I've had tutor, and I'll take the tutor. Well, you must have had an unusual tutor, because under the tutorial system too often, it's uh, a bored graduate student who can't wait to get rid of you, and the professor doesn't know you anymore and has nothing to show for it. No, I don't think either system has been very productive. I think the lecture system has the potential, uh, but not as it is now used. I know that when I went to the university, and still, you could buy the uh, course lectures and skip the class because the professor would repeat himself year after year without increasing his knowledge of the subject. That's terrible. 
the only ones who gave good lectures, with uh, uh, two or three exceptions, were those who were not full professors. Because once you attain they that were rank, working. Yes. You. Uh, That's the challenge again. Yes. You taught uh, three, four hours a week, and that was it. Well, decadence, I guess if we could flip through the pages of People magazine, which in my estimation features monsters and not people, uh, we could look at television. We could see decadence in action. We can see the collapse of values in action. I heard a discussion today on the uh, Crossfire program with Braden, uh, Pat Buchanan, and a couple of other people. It seems that this actress who calls herself Madonna, which is the mother of Jesus, mm -hmm. has made a dirty commercial for Pepsi-Cola. And the uh, original head of People for the American Way, which apparently believes that uh, Christianity is not part of the American Way, was defending it as perfectly fine a minister was in there uh, agitated about it and, and what uh, Podella I think the man is from the American way and he could not see why anyone should be offended I believe she did uh, a tape for videos in which she parodied the crucifixion and more and then uh, Pepsi-Cola killed her commercial uh, which they had paid five million dollars for really because they were afraid of uh, the kickback and rightly so well then I misunderstood the subject uh, under discussion because I, I thought they had I may be wrong on that but really? that was the impression I got you I may be right too. so disgusted with the news account of it that I may not have listened too carefully well, obviously, things are going by the board. Yes. Somebody else said to me that the lines, the categories, appear to be dissolving. Now, this fits in with your earlier comments on the lack of character involved in decadence. Because decadence can see, if it sees no good, it can also see no wrong. Well, if you create your own reality... You no longer live in a real world. It used to be a joke when we were young about the insane, and I'm told that there were a fair number in institutions who thought of themselves as Napoleon. And uh, that was a departure from reality, creating their own reality. And that's what our world is doing today. Well, we've created the reality of a great superpower, impregnable, Mm -hmm. capable of, uh, in the classic phase, we've got enough nuclear bombs to destroy the world. Well, we've got enough bullets in any arsenal to shoot to death all the people in the world also, but it doesn't mean that we have the capacity to use them. Yes. Well, the way out of decadence, I think, is what we ought to deal with. Uh, before we finish. And of course, in, in general terms, the answer is a biblical faith, Christianity. And I do feel that uh, the growing evidence of a virile Christianity gives us the first ray of hope in this century um, John White had uh, said that by 1952 the Supreme Court decided that Christianity was dead and they could begin dismantling the Christian structure of the United States and proceeded to do so. But what has happened, and it came as a shock in the 70s, was suddenly to find a very real return to the faith. Uh, in particular, so many of the young. The interesting thing is that out of the student riots of the 60s, two directions were taken by those who were involved in it. 
a fairly large number went into teaching and now dominate our universities and uh, grade and high schools or went into civil government so that we find the state both in its schools bureaucracy and elective offices uh, pretty well uh, covered by these uh, 60s revolutionaries but a sizable number became Christian and they are exercising an increasingly strong and rural influence in the churches and in the country. Well, revolutionaries that sought sanctuary on the civil service are somewhat amusing. Of course, they're mischievous and they're misleading many of the young. Mm -hmm. But they're not always effective in teaching the young what they think they're teaching because the uh, people are apt to go by what they see more than what they hear. And uh, the failure that uh, the state schools have become from coast to coast is evidence of that, and it is driving an increasing number of people into homeschooling and Christian schools, 35% of the population as of about a year and a half ago. So we're seeing some uh, things take place that don't get uh, reported in the daily paper, the net indicate there is a change underway. Well, you know there's a change underway because satirical skits that at one time uh, created great laughter are now creating indignation. If Sinclair Lewis were to bring out uh, Elmer Gantry today, he would have a much different uh, reaction from the audience than he had in the early 20s. Yes, and it was some years ago that the film Elmer Gantry was made and there was no outcry whatsoever. There no reaction at all. No. Now, a film like that would indeed bring about a major protest. Yes. So there is a... And again, it is the business of the challenge and the pressure. Christ yes. The Christian revival is in large measure, I'm sorry to say, due to the enemies of Christianity who are waking us up. Yes. And we go back to Paul Gottlieb saying that he's surprised at how easily the wasp was pushed off the stage. And my reflection later, that's because he didn't know there was a war. Once people realize that there are forces out to push them off the stage, why then there is an entirely different reality emerges. Mm -hmm. Yes. We have more Christians here than anywhere in the world. Better educated, in better circumstances, with more instruments at their disposal. And more vocal. And more vocal. And anyone who thinks that they're going to fade away has got another thought coming. Yes, um, it was assumed before the last election that the evangelical vote was finished. But uh, to the shock of many, it was very much in evidence and determinative, even though they didn't have a candidate. They still were felt. They can no longer bypass it. I think the result will be that the hostility and the attack will increase. But I think the resistance will also grow and we shall see some dramatic turnarounds before the century is over in about 11 years. Well, the Reformation in the first place came out of the most decadent stage that Europe at that, that time had ever reached. Yes. It was absolutely at the moral bottom mm -hmm. when the Reformation arose. Well, I think we are in the midst of a reformation, but unlike the reformation and counter-reformation, it deals with more than the uh, changing of the structure of the church. Yes. It's this time changing the structure of life across the board. The whole world. The whole world. The whole world is what is, because McLuhan was right, they have created an intellectual and communication global village mm -hmm. and, the, and the argument has now moved into the center of that arena. 
Well, it's an exciting time in which to be alive. I can hardly wait to see how it turns out. And Otto, I hope we both last long enough to see these so-and-sos get it in the neck and our side come out on top as it is certainly going to do. I agree. Very good. Thank you all for listening. Authorized by the Calcedon Foundation. Archived by the Mount Olive Tape Library. Digitized by Christ. Rules. dot com.